afternoon. Now, as scientists, you know that it's vital that the world out there, the general public, hear as much as we can tell them about science. We need to generate more interest in science to stop what is definitely the rot in the UK. And we've all heard so much about it. Not enough pupils studying science at school. And when they are studying science, they're being taught by teachers who actually are teaching something like physics when they haven't trained to teach physics at all and haven't done a degree in physics because there's such a shortage of teachers. More and more science departments are closing down at university. And this, of course, is bad for the economy. It's scientists, as you know, who make things, invent things that go on to be manufactured in a, on a large scale and help the economy. But one of the great events that's held every year, which is where the media of all kinds, television, radio, newspapers, magazines, meet the scientists, it's held at the Royal Society. I bumped into the science minister, Lord Drayson, who I'd come across a few years before, before he had this position, and he really summed it up. He said, science is the ladder which can help the UK to climb out of the recession. We need science so badly. This government has at last accepted this. But unfortunately, we in the West haven't accepted it soon enough. And in fact, India and China are training more science graduates now than the whole of Europe and the US combined. So I don't think any of us need to guess when we look at the economies, East versus West, in 10 years' time, we know where the strength of the economy will be. So what can we, what can you do to create more interest in science, to communicate more effectively? And you might think, well, what can I do? But I can tell you, you just have to go out there, talk, do media interviews, local radio, local television, national television. And once you're known to the media, it snowballs. And I work with a lot of scientists at the Royal Society, some very young, just starting out in their career, some of them professors, people doing research of all different kinds. Those that find that they're good at the media, or they come on our courses, I put them in front of television, show them how to write articles for national newspapers. Once they get started, they become stars, and they go out, and you can all do that. That's what I want to convince you of today. So what is the best way of reaching an audience? Well, I'm going to talk about all sorts of different audiences, but we'll start with television, because television is the best way of reaching a huge audience. 86% of people in this country get their news, first of all, from television. And Tomorrow's World, how many of you can remember Tomorrow's World? <laughs> Everybody, brilliant. Well, that's a good start. Well, I presented Tomorrow's World for 20 years, and in that time, every program was reaching 12 million people. That's an astonishing viewing figure. It was so popular. And it also encouraged young people to study science. A big survey was done to find out why pupils chose science as their subject, and there were two reasons. One was an inspirational teacher who switched them on to science, the other was watching Tomorrow's World and seeing something that made them think, science is fascinating, I want to go into that area. I only became an astronomer or I only became a, a biological scientist because I was watching Tomorrow's World when whatever happened. And that really is marvellous. So it encourages young people to study science. But of course, with viewing figures like that, and it ran for nearly 40 years, it gave inventions and it gave scientists publicity, which helped their success. I met somebody I'd never met before just this weekend, and she said, I'm married to somebody. His invention was shown on Tomorrow's World. You actually presented it. And as a result, it took off, went around the world, and he's a millionaire. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as you know, the BBC culled Tomorrow's World 10 years ago, after almost 40 years on the screen. But the good news is that it will be back this summer, next month, after a public outcry. Scientists in particular 
have been writing to the BBC, emailing the BBC and saying, why don't we have a popular science program? It's a disgrace. So it's going to be on BBC One. It starts on July the 14th. And it's called Bang Goes the Theory. But the BBC says, we have reinvented tomorrow's world for a modern audience. It is tomorrow's world in all but name. So I've seen a little preview of it. I've been helping them to find some scientists to present it. <coughs> but I haven't seen enough to know whether it really is going to replace the good old tomorrow's world. But to get you in the mood for the new tomorrow's world, let me me remind you of what you've all been missing for 10 years, helped by one of my neighbours in Gloucestershire. To give us an insight into the challenge ahead for these innovators, I've invited along a few of the competition judges whose professions range from finance to medicine, but who all share a concern to see British technology succeed commercially. And here too, of course, Judy. City of Lights. Fashion, romance, culture. A city which within a year should only be three hours away from London by train. And home to a series of grand projects designed to make this the most modern and most advanced, the capital city of Europe. This is the biologist's answer to the philosopher's question, what makes a human being? It's DNA. And in the vat behind me, cooled by liquid nitrogen, they collected the essence of 8,000 people. Now, I've been describing DNA for years. This is actually the first time that I've handled some. And it still amazes me to think that stuff like this decides all of my physical characteristics, from the curliness of my hair to the shape of my eyes. In 1974, a Hungarian professor of architecture designed this to demonstrate spatial relationships to his students. But to his surprise, the cube became more than a puzzle. It became big business. And today, Professor Rubik launches four new puzzles. Now this one has seven plates inside, and the idea is you have to try and make all of the dots white. Simple, but I find it very difficult. This summer, I went to Hungary to see how the cube has become an industry. And in just a few seconds, it freezes this flower solid. You can see now that it shatters because it's so brittle. And that same brittleness has limited a potentially important surgical technique called cryosurgery. So far, cryosurgery has been used as a quick and simple way of removing things like warts and moles by rapidly freezing them using a probe like this. Because it doesn't involve cutting with a scalpel, very little scar tissue forms. But just as that flower freezes, so does the plastic tube carrying liquid nitrogen to the probe. And if this touches healthy tissue, it can cause serious cold burns, a hazard for surgeons as well as patients. That's one reason why cryoprobes cooled by liquid nitrogen have been restricted in their use, certainly for very little internal surgery. And the fact that the tube also becomes rigid as it is now means that the patient has to be manoeuvred around this probe rather than the probe being manoeuvred around the patient. Now, Prince Charles was appearing there on a programme which he presented with me on Tomorrow's World for 12 years. And now that encouraged people to innovate. And an award was given called the Prince of Wales Award for Innovation. So he did an awful lot for science in that way. But despite that, he is seen by many people today as being anti-science, as I'm sure you all know. He's anti-nanotechnology. He described it as grey goo that's going to take over the world. He's anti-GM crops. I worked for five years on the uh, government commission.